Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for waking us up, giving us our first inheritance, Lord God, which is life. Father, we're grateful for this time to gather with you this morning, to join with our brothers and sisters, Lord God, to hear you minister to our hearts, our minds, Lord God. We are the only ones about our faith. Lord, we just thank you this morning. We thank you for troubles and stressors, Lord God, seen and unseen. We thank you, Lord God, for life, health, strength. We thank you, Lord God, for our families. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the favor and the mercy and grace that you showered upon us. We thank you, Father God, for today. New mercies, new grace, new excitement, new adventures, the newness of life altogether, Lord God. So, Father, we're joining together, Lord God, just to praise you and to worship you, to honor you and to glorify you, Lord God, to learn more of you. We may bring you glory, that we, Heavenly Father, may please you. Help us today, Lord God, to have a heart of gratitude, to have a mind, Lord God, that is seeking after Christ, ready and poised to be transformed by the renewing of itself. Give us, Lord God, a heart that is filled with your love and compassion towards our brothers and sisters. And as we do so, Lord God, we come before your throne humbling ourselves, letting you know that we repent of every sin, every transgression, and every iniquity. Asking you, Lord God, to wash us clean, to purge us with his hope that we may be clean in your sight. We stand before you, Father God, with clean hearts and clean hands, only through Christ Jesus. We understand that there's nothing good in us. And that it's only through the finished work on the cross that Christ accomplished that makes us worthy enough to even be called your sons and daughters. So, Father, receive our worship and receive our praise today. Receive our heart of repentance. Keep us in this posture, Lord God, that we'll be quick to listen for your voice. We'll be slow to speak, Lord God, and slow to anger. We thank you, Father God, that no matter what happens in our lives today, you are with us. We love you and we praise you. We honor and adore you. For those who are gathered on the line this morning, Lord God, we ask you to bless them, Heavenly Father. Touch them right there where they are. Meet them at their need, Lord God, and exceed all expectations that they may have upon you. Showing them that, Lord God, you are not only Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God who provides for us, but, Lord God, you are the place of provision. So wherever you send us, Lord God, You've already prepared a way, and provision is waiting there for us. So as we are starting this particular day, Lord God, one that we've never seen before, never experienced before, we know that your provision is going to meet us in this day. We know that, Lord God, your peace is going to meet us in this day. Your love, your guidance, your truth will be made manifest in this day. Help us, Lord God, to share what we learned today with someone else. That what you remind us of, Lord God, keep it in the forefront of our minds. That we may not sin against you. That we, Heavenly Father, may be a better reflection of the royal family. And most of all, Father God, Help us to be willing to bear the infirmities of the weak, those who are sick among us. Let us be willing to lay hands that healing may be their portion. Those, Lord God, who are grieving or bereaved, help us to comfort them as your spirit comforts. Help us to be reminded, Lord God, that we are your hands and your feet in this earth. And you're calling us now, Lord God, to service. 
We love you, Lord God, and we praise you. Sit Chantel down. Breathe up your spirit within you. Minister to your sons, your daughters, through this vessel, Lord God. Let it be none of me and all of you, Father God. Speak Holy Spirit that we may hear and receive, that we may be stretched, Lord God, that wisdom and knowledge may come forth, and, Lord God, we receive with gladness. That what you're saying. Help us to even be willing to study, to verify that what is said today is truth to life through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, intercessors. It's wonderful to see you all in the, uh, in the presence of the Lord this morning. We're going to study this week about God Almighty, the mighty creator. And, of course, we know that the Hebrew name for the mighty creator is Elohim. Amen? Elohim. And we know so much about this because if you've ever studied Genesis, if you've ever studied the Old Testament, it's been right there. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God that appears in Genesis 1 and 1. So when we pray to Elohim, we remember that he is the one who began it all, creating the heavens and the earth and separating light from darkness. Separating water from dry land, day from night, right? The ancient name for God contains, or this particular ancient name, Elohim, for God contains the idea of God's creative power as well as his authority and his sovereignty. Amen. So Jesus used a form of it, of this particular name, in his agonized prayer from the cross, if you recall. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloah, Eloah, let me about you. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so we understand that when we speak about Elohim, that it was first presented by the writer who wrote the first five books, a man of the Bible, which was Moses, which would be considered the Torah. So we're going to use our focus scripture, which is Genesis 1. Amen? And I'm going to read this. I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm going to go to the Lord Says, say, stop. Amen. Amen. So starting at Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless, void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a deep, I'm sorry, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, then God said, let there be light. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the water and let it separate the waters from the waters. He called the dome sky. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. God called the land, the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called the he called seeds. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds and fruit trees and of every kind on earth that bear fruit with it, with the seed in it. And God said, let there be light in the dome of the sky to separate the day from night. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of every kind. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let, him, um, let them 
have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild things of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Now King James says, Replenish the earth. Amen. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. Now that is Genesis 1 out of the R, or out, out of, excuse me, out of the NRSV version of the Bible. I figured that was a little bit shorter than reading out of the King James. But you know that we'll break this down a little bit later on during the week. So I want you all to remember that Elohim is a plural form of El or Eloah. And it's one of the oldest designations for divinity in the world. Now, the reason why it's Elohim, plural set meaning God, is because the writer, Moses, remember, he was a Hebrew who was raised as an Egyptian prince. So in Egypt, they believed in many gods. So when he realized after the first 40 years being trained, groomed as an Egyptian prince, that he was Hebrew. So when he began to write the Torah, he wrote in hieroglyphs, and his brother Aaron translated into Hebrew. Amen. So I want to make sure that we're clear on this and that this is the focus. And remember, we're laying the background story here. So the Hebrews borrowed the term El from the Canaanites. Amen. And it can refer either to the true God or to pagan gods. Though El is used more than 200 times in the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible, Elohim is used more than 2,500 times. Its plural form is used not to indicate a belief in many gods, but to emphasize the majesty of the one true God. He is the God of gods, the highest of all. So Christians may recognize it in the plural form, a hint of the Trinity. Amen. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. However, we also know that going on scripture and scripture alone, we cannot verify or validate that because scripture does not point to or break it down in no sense. Amen? So Elohim occurs 31 times in the first chapter of Genesis. After that, the name Yahweh appears. As well, um, it is often paired with Elohim especially in the NIV version of the Bible. And you know where Pastor Trey always says the NIV is a trick Bible, right? <laughs> Amen. And so the two together, Yahweh and Elohim, are translated as the Lord God. So now that's our background story. We have the underlying truth, and we're a little clearer on that. Amen? So as I was meditating on that, and the Lord was just speaking to me about how we, how we view things. And then he started talking to me about the power of our tongue, the power of our words, which is parallel to talking about Genesis, and then like, especially chapter 1. Because first God, he spoke it out of his mouth, but he formed the earth then he filled the earth. He formed the universe, then he filled it. So the words that we speak, because we're made in God's image, they have the wuha breath of God whenever we speak a thing, which is the creative power of God, which is the breath of life that we breathe now. He took me over to Psalms 141, verse 3, and it says, Lord, Help me control my tongue. Help me to be careful when I say, I'm sorry, careful about what I say. 
I'll stop there for just a moment. Because I think that's powerful enough all by itself. And I've told you all many times about my girlfriend. And we talk a lot about her children. Um, but I find it interesting that um, recently, about a year and a half ago, her son and her daughter in, lo in love and their four children moved to Kansas City, where she and her husband are now. And they moved in with them while they were searching for a house. So one day at the dinner table, there was a quite animated conversation between the nine-year-old twins. And so there's a play-by-play, -play, so to speak, account of their school day that they were talking about. But the, the conversation kind of went like this. They were about midway through dinner. and there was this brief moment of silence. It didn't last long because, like I said, one of the twins turned and asked her grandmother, do you know what's the strongest muscle in the human body? Her grandmother said she stopped to think about it for a moment before offering some answer. But once she answered, her granddaughter said, nope, that's not it, before she even got the second syllable out. So the grandmother said, I give up. What is the strongest muscle? And her granddaughter with her big blue twinkling eyes and a huge grin on her face said, it's the tongue. The second twin yelled out. Now, I can bet that none of us have done thorough research on this. But just because the conversation came across my ears, I did. So the child was correct because the tongue is not really one muscle. It's sort of like a conglomerate of eight different muscles. So when it comes to versatility, the tongue is indeed powerful. Its combination of elasticity and forcefulness gives us the ability to speak, eat, sit, swallow. The list is quite impressive when you think about it, right? But according to scripture, the tongue may very well be the strongest muscle in the body. And it has not one bone. In fact, God has a lot to say about the power of the tongue and the words that we speak. Words are power tools that, in the right hand, and used correctly, can build and encourage. However, in the wrong hand, and used incorrectly, words can destroy and defeat. So unless strained through discipline and holiness, words can impart false perspectives and untruths into people or into situations, right? But the right words spoken at the right time and in the right way can bring order in the midst of confusion, light on a very dark path, and wisdom for questions that seem too hard uh, to have no answer. So I believe that God gives us spiritual radars so that we can assess the situation and speak the right words for that circumstance, if we choose. Key word in that phrase is if we choose, right? So in fact, the Apostle Paul writes, let your conversation be gracious and effective so that you will have the right answer for everyone, Colossians 4 and 6. We just need to check the radar screen before we speak. We need to check with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Solomon offers great wisdom concerning the use of words. He says, whoever controls his mouth protects his own life. Whoever has a big mouth comes to ruin, Proverbs 13 and 3. So in other words, if we do not learn to use and control our tongue, it will use and control us. Have you ever thought about it in that sense? 
Mm -hmm. I love the wisdom of Solomon. Proverbs 34 and 13 offers a very clear directive to keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. The word keep indicates an action on our part, though. So we decide. We choose the words that we speak. <laughs> that means we must guard our heart and our mind. Because remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we choose what is allowed to take up room in our mind. It is literally the idea of a guard standing at a gate of a city, right? He's stationed there to keep watch. He is there by invitation only. So if we want to live right and speak right, we must first think right. Did you catch that? So godly responses come from the heart. If there is something wrong with our words, then there is something wrong with our heart. The truth of Proverbs 16 and 23 is profound in its simplicity. A wise man's heart guides his mouth. So a judge utters a few words, and a guilty man is taken to death row. A friend speaks a word of encouragement, and a desperate heart finds hope. A mother lashes out with angry words, and the light in her child's eyes is gone. A wife offers a word of forgiveness, and a marriage is restored. A gossip makes a phone call, and a reputation is destroyed. A teenager says no and charges the course, I'm sorry, and changes the course of her life or his life. Think about it. So, yes, the tongue is strong and powerful, as are the words that we speak. So I challenge you all today, let's choose today to speak words of life, words of encouragement, edification. Amen? So my challenge to you is to examine your words that you've chosen today in the light of the following verse. Psalms 20 verse 14 says, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, if you want that from the King James Version, we know it says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So I want you all to think about that. As you have questions posed to you today, as you have People come to you for encouragement, advice, insight. And some will just come and don't know why they come. Think about how do you encourage them. I encourage you to memorize the verse, Psalms 20, verse 14, and ask God to let, let it take root in your heart and work its way out of, your, out of your mouth through your words that you speak today. Because learning to control our tongue and carefully choose the words that we speak is a powerful spiritual tool. And we can explore different methods and verses and scriptures or steps all together that can help us become powerful men and women of God, as we learn to use our words to bring forth life in others, using our words to strengthen ourselves, encourage ourselves, and encourage others, building them up, esteeming them higher than ourselves. Amen? So meditate on that for just a moment as I close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, today. We thank you, Lord, for your words of encouragement. We thank you for showing up today, this morning, Lord God, and meeting us here, loving on us and gathering us here. Father, we want to please you and encourage others with the words that we speak. Clean our hearts, God. Transform our minds and fill our mouths with your words that honor 
who please you, my Lord. Elohim, mighty one, you made everything out of nothing, imposed order on chaos, gave birth to beauty and called it all good. Help each and every one of us to know you as the one true God, the one who created everything and everyone, the one who has placed each and every one of us on the earth for a purpose, designed us specifically to your specification, all to magnify your holy name. Give us clarity on our assignment today. And let your love and compassion be reflected in not just our thoughts or our words, but also our actions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts? Did this encourage you? Did it remind you of some things? Did God speak to your situation? Did it give you some insight and clarity? This is our time to share in a session.